All right, welcome back to the Grand Solar Minimum channel. Today is Thursday, January 6, 2021. We've got a information pack type video tonight, so sit back and let's get started. Here's some space weather for you. Solar wind speeds are pretty moderate right now, sitting at 343.8 kilometers per second with a density of 1.9. Right now we have two sunspot regions, AR2994 and AR2925, sunspot number 24. So these are pretty weak sunspots. Uh, we'll check out what is around the corner here when we go to the grandsolarminimum.com and look at the far side of the sun. Uh, but right now, 64 days that were spotless uh, so far. Well, actually that has to be reset. Oh boy, my bad guys. It is January 2022, and uh, guess what? That means that we are zero days. So <clears throat> let's go ahead and recap. We spent 2021 with 64 days without sunspots. Um, compare this to 2010, which was 51, so we definitely surpassed what we had coming out of solar cycle 23 and starting 24. So now we start a new year. Days without sunspots. Ironically, we were super busy with sunspots before uh, we had the new year. We actually had a sunspot number of 141, believe it or not. And then we get to the new year and things calm down big time. We're looking at two sunspots with a number of 24, which is averaging 12 sunspots per active region. The average minimum size sunspot is between 11 and 15. So yet we are still technically coming out of a minimum going into a maximum. And even though sunspot activity has picked up over the past several weeks, we're still seeing smaller sunspots and nothing too too impressive at this point so sunspot number 24 with two active regions is not that impressive still minimum strength sunspots at this moment now we had some flares crackling last week some in-class flares uh no doubt but nothing major nothing anything damaging to the grid or anything like that still in the early part of this maximum so it's going to be a while before we see that kind of strength as far as these stronger uh, X-Class flares and whatnot. We'll continue to monitor the situation as we have seen the sun go up and down in activity, get real busy, quiet down. Actually, before uh, today, yesterday, and the day before, we only had one sunspot, and that was a sunspot number of 12. So to go from 141 sunspot number to 12, in a less than seven days, it's, it's quite a jump, honestly, to see it go that way. Cosmic radiation dosage rates, 8.9% is the dosage rates. And also, that is a change of 1.1%. Now, the thing about the cosmic radiation dosage rates, they're still pretty high. The average dosage rates we saw at the bottom of a minimum was between 9.6 and 11.1. Those were the, the higher rates during the solar minimum. We're not seeing that right now with cosmic radiation dosage rates. Uh, starting to decline just a little bit, but still pretty high for what we are experiencing right now, this part of the cycle, which is supposed to be upticking towards a maximum. We've had cosmic radiation dosage rates over 5% now for more than five years. Uh, according to the charts that we reference here on spaceweather.com, that is a, um, a pretty lengthy time. Usually, um, we're seeing a little bit less time of peak cosmic radiation. But solar cycle 24 and 25 has proven otherwise, and we are still continuing to see high cosmic radiation dosage rates. Let's go ahead and take a look at some things over at the grandsolarminimum.com. Check out the far side of the sun. We're starting to see solar x-ray flux activity pick up just a little bit, which could be an indication of an oncoming, 
oncoming solar flare. KP indices have been rather low and quiet, so nothing too fancy going on over here. Sun acting like a minimum type sun still. But let's go ahead and take a look at the far side. What do we have coming as far as sunspot activity? And she didn't load. Sorry about that, folks. Thought that was ready. Computers, what do you do? All right, so that is not available. My apologies there. But with the two sunspots in the southern region moving Earth facing, uh, last time I checked the far side of the sun, there is more activity piercing the eastern limb. So stay tuned. This little lull will not last very long, folks. All right, let's get started in tonight's um, articles. Start first here at Watchers, as always. Heavy snow hits Tokyo, forcing the JMA to issue the city's first heavy snow warning since 2018. Now, before everybody uh, gets, you know, <clears throat> on me for reporting this, because the, the, the amount of snow that fell is not that big of a deal to us. But here in Tokyo, it snows like twice a year. And they broke some records that they haven't had in quite some time. In fact, the last time we saw a snowfall like this was 2018. We were heading into a minimum, if not already pretty much settling there in the minimum at that time. So exiting and entering the cycles minimum, and we happen to have snow records broken with almost similar type uh, well, actually, I take that back. There was a lot less uh, solar activity in 2018 than there is right now, for sure. But nonetheless, we have seen record snows in this past solar minimum. So the correlation there, lower solar activity, seems to bring out these record snow and rain events like it has done here. Parts of Tokyo getting 3.9 inches of rain, uh, accumulated Snow, 2.3 inches of rain of snow also in the city of Subaka or Sukubu, I should say. Sukaba, Sukaba. Yeah, I'm really butchering that. I need my 13-year-old. He knows how to speak Japanese, so I do apologize. Not only are we seeing snow records, though, but coldest day in 19 years, also in Tokyo. 19 years. 37 degrees Fahrenheit is the record there. So. Again, big deal. Tokyo doesn't get a lot of snow. And these are beautiful pictures. Looked heavier than two to three inches, that's for sure. But this is coupled in with uh, the heavy snows that we've already seen on the eastern seaboard of Japan. We've already seen heavy snow hit the eastern part. And now this right here, you know, temperatures below average, uh, record-breaking low temperatures here and record-breaking snow. Four inches of snow is a lot of snow. It's the heaviest since records started in 1876, which was also 2018. I'm sorry, so it's the heaviest since 2018, and this is the 10th heaviest snowfall that Tokyo has seen since records have begun. So my question is, if we have if we have global warming, then why are we seeing the 10th heaviest snow in the history of Japan as far as records being recorded? Because if we were warming, like these so-called experts say we are, there would be less snow falling, correct? Not more snow, right? Less cold, right? Right? Well, Nashville's snowiest day in years wreaks havoc on the roads. Guys, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to fly through these uh, articles, okay? I'm, I'm going to fly through these because, to me, this is pretty busy. First of the year, it's January, and it is acting like January here in the United States. It says here, as a snowstorm continues to work its way through Tennessee Valley before setting its sights on the northeast, it has snarled traffic in the process and has caused major chaos on roadways. Let's go. New Jersey governor issues state of emergency as storm approaches. Uh, Phil Murphy declares state of emergency ahead of the winter storm. That could bring as much as six inches of snow to parts of the state. The state of emergency is set to begin tonight at 10 p.m. Eastern time. 
and we'll go through Friday. They could see rates of two inches per hour in New Jersey. National Guard deployed in Kentucky amid snowstorm. Kentucky Governor Andy Bashar has deployed the Kentucky National Guard to assist state police in dealing with accidents on snow-covered roads across the state. Again, please stay off the roads unless absolutely necessary, says Bashar. As we move along, snow and ice travel across Tennessee and more headlines. Folks, they've been hit twice in a week, by the way. Multiple accidents and traffic jams across Tennessee. Snarl travel near Nashville Highway Patrol, Metro Nashville Police and Police Department uh, helped to get vehicles off the road that had swerved into ditches, along with the driver and a few pets that had been inside. All were injured. Uh, they, I'm sorry, they were uninjured, to be exact. But again, eight inches of snow in Murfreesboro, folks. Murfreesboro is just below, about 45 minutes south of uh, Nashville. So that's a big deal. Eight inches. Of, I lived in Manchester, and I can tell you right now, an inch closed schools. An inch. They got a lot of snow. Accumulating snow. Ongoing snowstorm that shipped from Tennessee Valley to the northeast. Right now, Nashville and Knoxville, Tennessee has accumulated three to six inches of snow. That is now heading towards the mid-Atlantic. Temperatures plummet in Nashville. The miserable weather in Nashville won't leave the, the snow tonight. After the storm and snowfall move on, the temperature in Nashville is forecasted to plummet to four degrees low tonight. Four degrees. Four degrees. I'm here to tell you right now, folks, Central Tennessee does not get four degree temperatures in the first part of January uh, that far south. So some serious winter-like conditions kicking in. Now, I want to point this out, too, here in Tennessee. We saw um, December tornadoes. And, of course, you saw the AGW crowd running and saying, oh, I told you, climate change, global warming is causing all these tornadoes. And in fact, I did a broadcast talking about what has to be in place for a tornado outbreak like that to happen. And the, the, the warm, the unusually warm weather this late in the year mixed in with all the cold air that was already in the atmosphere and the persistent cold air in the upper atmosphere is what triggered these tornadoes. Two weeks later, we're talking about record-breaking cold and record-breaking snow. Again, it's winter. That's all. It's just winter weather. And this year, it's getting a little colder further south. That's all it is. It's not climate change. Temperatures will rebound in Tennessee, and they will see the sun again, I promise. But I just wanted to point that out. The same folks that were crying about global warming are now the same folks who are experiencing snow when trying to blame the climate crisis on man-made global warming for the tornadoes. So how do they answer back with two, not one, but two accumulating snow systems that move through? This storm also will likely become a bomb cyclone by the time it gets to the eastern seaboard. Since snow rates of one to three inches per hour could occur in the northeastern portions of Maryland, including around Baltimore, southeastern Pennsylvania, New Jersey, and up towards New York City late Thursday night around daybreak on Friday as the storm pulls in more moisture. Insane stuff here, folks. All-out blizzard conditions are likely to unfold across eastern Maine where the winds will frequently reach 40 miles per hour or higher, and snow and blowing snow will reduce visibility under a quarter mile at times. These intense conditions could occur for a time on Friday in eastern Massachusetts. Pennsylvania plow salt trucks ready for the impending storm. They better be. New York City sanitation to utilize all new vehicles to keep bike lanes safe from snow and ice. Snow triggers dozens of accidents on Interstate 55 in Missouri. Nashville experiences snowiest day since 2016. A record for the snowiest day since 8 inches of snow accumulated on January 22nd, 2016. That was my birthday. Actually, so it didn't quite snow as much as it did on my birthday in 2016, but it snowed half that. Still, more snow. What's up, right? What's up? All these tornadoes, you guys are saying global warming. You were blaming the climate crisis on these tornadoes, and now it's snowing twice. Of course, they'll probably try to blame the snow now on global warming. That's that's their favorite thing to do. But folks, plenty of winter going on across the Tennessee Valley. 
into the Mid-Atlantic, into the Northeast, and let's not forget the Northwest as well. Yeah, winter storm impact where, uh, areas in New England. Again, more traffic issues for the Northeast. New York and further up, though, missed out. This is going to be more of a coastal situation. They were calling for a foot of snow, but this storm has trekked further towards the coast. But not only are we seeing the weather in the south, the mid-south, and the northeast, but also prolonging period of winter weather is expected across portions of the northwest U.S. through Friday, January 7th, and not just over the higher terrain either. An area of low pressure will track southeast along the western coast of Vancouver Island on Thursday, and Thursday night, January 6, 2022, and then into northwest Washington by Friday. Low pressure system is expected to produce several inches of snow across the mountain ranges and passes, along with widespread areas of moderate to heavy snowfall into the lowland areas of northeast Washington. Freezing rain also a part of this party as well. And just like here in the northeast, the northwest getting pummeled with winter weather. Again, Still looking for all these naysayers out there that claims that we're going to be warm for this winter. Look at the jet stream, how far it dips down into the south. Look at that. Good Lord. So a huge cold front blasting through, lots of high pressure, and that usually means that we're going to be dealing with lots of dry air. So notice where we have the high pressure, we have less snow. This is going to be lighter over here. Obviously going to be much heavier back here during the low pressure area where there's plenty of moisture to support these storm systems. We, it's like we've been seeing a nonstop atmospheric river here invading on the northwest for quite some time. So not just in the Mid-South or the Mid-Atlantic or the Northeast, but the Northwest as well. All quiet across the central part of the United States, and that's okay, right? While we're on the Northwest side, Alaska sets new December temperature records. Now, just to be fair, there were high temperature records broken in Alaska, followed by cold record temperatures as well. Now, some of these record warm temperatures were 20 degrees above the actual record. That's pretty high. But here's some of the cold records that were broke. Low temperature on December 26 dipped as low as negative 7, and that is pretty cool. Let's try to find out when the record was for that. New daily record lows were set in the city of Ketchikan, Negative 17.7 Celsius on December 26, breaking their previous low record temperature of 5 degrees Fahrenheit in 1917. So over a 100-year-old low temperature record was broken. Uh, their highest temperature was 16 degrees, which also their record could uh, cold high temperature for that date. Again, another cold record broken here as well. Uh, let's see, normal high for this time of year is 40 degrees Fahrenheit, and the normal low is 32. So you can see 16 degrees being a high for the day is pretty brutal for that part of Alaska. Other locations also broke their daily low temperature records with Juno Forecast Office recording a negative 7 Fahrenheit, Hain with a negative 2 Fahrenheit, the Klawak Airport came in at 3 above 0, Pelican at 10 degrees Fahrenheit, and Thorn Bay at a balmy zero. Speaking of temperatures, we didn't report on this right away, and that is our apologies. Mari and I are still getting settled into our new base camp, as you call it, uh, but we will be increasing our shows hopefully more than just once a week. We're shooting to do uh, weekly daily shows Monday through Friday. And then as we get near February, you will notice a, a lot more happening. Mari's already beginning the upgrade of some of our stuff on our website. She's starting to put in the work that will be started here very, very soon, folks. So bear with us. We're getting there. We promise more content is definitely on the way. But we didn't report on the UAH right on time this time. But it did go up to 0.21 degrees above baseline. We were at 0.08 in November, and then in December, we've seen an increase of 0.13. Still, we are nowhere near that peak that threw everyone through the roof about global warming and climate crisis. We continue to drop, and these continue to form declination indication. All right? No indication that we're going to see another peak up here or anything like that at this time. Even with all that extra sunspot activity, 
we still didn't see a rise in temperatures as expected. So, again, when we look at temperatures for January and February and March, that will be the telltale of do we see below baseline before we get to spring. I kind of called it earlier in the year that we would see below baseline temperatures by March. We'll see. I think there's plenty of cold in the northern hemisphere to accomplish that for sure, folks. And speaking of cold, <clears throat> I wanted to talk about what the Washington Post, this is our juicy article of the night. Election misinformation helped fuel the January 6th Capitol attack. Now climate misinformation threatens the planet. This is by Maxine Jose Lowe. I think that's how you pronounce her name, with research by Alexandra Ellerbach. So you guys can look them up and give them a nice little hello email. Say, uh, say about, uh, you know, what are you talking about type email. Good morning and welcome to the Climate 202, she says. On our first anniversary of the January 6th insurrection at the U.S. Capitol, uh, it's inserting copies of its investigation series, The Attack, before, during, and after the 2700, blah, 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 blah. But now they're saying that people that were in charge of, you know, the whole conspiracy of January 6th are also in charge of this climate misinformation. That's right, folks. According to this, according to this article here, now this is supposedly from a Ph.D. student. It says here, Kathy Treen, a Ph.D. student at University of Exeter in England, who published a recent paper on climate misinformation, agreed with that assessment. She says it's completely predictable who reject climate science. It's the same people who reject vaccines and who reject the reality of COVID. Now, I told Mari about this, and she tells me, and I agree with this as well, this is just another way to further segregate people. They're trying to lump climate change deniers people who don't want to take this vaccine and people who are fed up with COVID regulations that don't make sense. And they want to make those people Republicans. They're trying to, this is all po po politics. When you read anything off of the Washington Post, they are not doing anything but benefit benefiting the Democratic Party. They slander Republicans. They slander real science when it comes to climate, and they slander anyone who goes against the global warming theory. Now, what I've been taught, guys, is that science, there is no consensus. And if we all agreed on it, it's not science. There's no more debating, right? It's something else. What is it called? Authoritarian type stuff? Mari is really the one who talks to me about this being more than just a disagreement in information, but a full-on attack on the world citizens. And I'll, and I'll read on here in a minute. I'll tell you what this means, because they're trying to really, really pour on the nonsense here. But so this lady here is lumping if you're a republican well you must not believe in covid and you probably don't believe in vaccines and you probably don't believe in global warming but in fact i know people who are democrats who don't believe in global warming i know people who are republicans who take covid seriously and i also know republicans who have been vaccinated so already the ad hominem attacks from washington post are already unsuccessful as they are completely misstating information and misleading the public, misleading the Democratic public, I should say, because that's the only people that actually read this and take it serious. It says here, I think there's a misconception that climate misinformation is not as dangerous as COVID or election information, but it is, okay, support according to these guys. Now, here's where it gets funny. But Steve Beloy, a climate change skeptic who served on Trump's transition team at the Environmental Protection Agency, currently has a verified Twitter account with more than 37,000 followers. <gasps> oh, my God. 
from which he has shared false information or unproven information about global warming and its effects. Well, that's slander, Washington Post. Because you're now sharing an article with unproven information about global warming and its effects. On Tuesday, for example, Malloy tweeted that the record-breaking wildfires in Colorado last week was caused by natural drought. Scientists said that the fire was intensified by climate change, which caused unnaturally warm and dry conditions for this time of year. It happens. It's an anomaly. Again, the media is trying to drive fear into the sheeple who believe this crap, who follow this crap, who watch the news and believe every word that comes out of the newsman's mouth. That's what the Washington Post stands for. Cook of Monash University said he views Malloy as a clear source of misinformation who should not be, who should be white, who should be whitelisted by the platform. What's whitelisted? What? <laughs> Reached by phone yesterday, Malloy said he thinks that Twitter and other social media companies have no business fact-checking users' posts about climate change. He's right. He says, I'm totally opposed to big tech censoring people from discussing issues. If people can show I'm wrong, they should shame me off of Twitter. That's right. That's right. That's my fault. I got the dogs barking by clapping. But that is right. If, and this is what I said when Google announced they were demonetizing channels like us and others who talk about global cooling and, and natural climate change, if I'm wrong, shame me off of YouTube, shame me off of Google, shame me off of the internet if I'm wrong. And that's what Malloy said, and he's absolutely right. Now, for those of you who don't know, Steve Malloy, kind of a big deal here, but he is with the Heartland Institute and one of the more finer organizations when it comes to fighting this battle of climate change crisis and the panic that these people are causing. Unnecessary panic. Now, the information about the fires out in Colorado, if you go to Malloy's Twitter page, he shows you a graph that shows you the past several years of fire, informa uh, fire data, and that information is up and down, up and down. We have fires, we have drought. We have fires, we have droughts, we don't have fires, we don't have droughts, but it happens, and it's natural, and it's on a cycle, just like everything else, with the sun. But again, the bottom line is, Steve Malloy took the phone call, answered the question, was not snarky, and he's right. If people can show I'm wrong, then shame me off of Twitter. And that has not happened yet. Mr. Malloy is still on Twitter posting facts about the climate. Just like several other folks that we follow on Twitter that do the same. David Birch, very good uh, resource out of the UK, a good friend of ours of this channel. Also, we are wishing him well as he is fighting cancer right now. He is in his second round of chemo. So, Dave, if you're listening, we love you, brother, and hope everything is going well. Today is his first day of his second round of treatment. But... This has been happening since they started the demonetizing, and that wasn't enough. They realized that demonetizing channels on YouTube and Google didn't stop the information. It slowed us down a little bit, sure, but it didn't stop the information. Now, this article goes in a little bit more, not just talking about um, Steve Malloy, but a YouTube. Yeah, that's right. A YouTuber made this one. Check this out. Now, this is the funny one right here. This is where mainstream media is lying to you big time. Talking about Telegram, an encrypted messaging app that was used by the Proud Boys. Again, they want to mention that a conservative group happened to use this app. So now it's, oh, it's definitely, you know, tainted, right? Because a conservative group used it. But what if there's Democratic groups that use Telegram too? Just saying. Last year, Telegram was flooded with messaging blasting mask mandates vaccine requirements, and other measures designated to slow the spread of COVID-19. More recently, some of the same Telegram users have pivoted to spreading a conspiracy theory about an impending climate lockdown. Now, they act like that this isn't real. And when I say they, I say Washington Post. They obviously didn't read the Green New Deal. 
The theory goes that in the future, governments will impose similar restrictions on their citizens to reduce carbon emissions that contribute to climate change. For example, governments could limit people's ability to eat red meat, drive gas-powered vehicles, or fly in airplanes. That is exactly what the Build Back Better bill is trying to do. The climate change policies that are in us, the Green New Deal, that's exactly what's going. This is not a conspiracy theory. This is a fact. They do want to control how you drive your gas-powered vehicle or how you fly in airplanes. They do because states like New York are banning lawnmowers that are gasoline-powered. States like New York are banning uh, gasoline engine sales by 2025. What? How, so how is this a conspiracy theory when it's a reality already beginning? So let's take a Telegram user named Christian Westbrook who goes by the name of Ice Age Farmer and has more than 82,000 followers. It's got a lot more than that. I promise you that. After extensively criticizing vaccines, which that's his prerogative. Everyone's allowed to have their opinion. I mean, come on. Does that make him an evil guy because he goes against one thing? Westbrook began evangelizing about a potential climate lockdown in September of 2020. It all makes sense now, he says, in terms of why we have the de deployment of the police state in the pandemic. They are getting people acclimated to complete police state that is needed for a climate lockdown. Well, yeah, of course they are. How many of you right now live in a state where you're dealing with COVID restrictions? And then the state right next to you isn't doing a thing about it. There's too much mixed messaging out there. So it'd be different if everybody was on the same page with COVID. We're not. There is lots of information that shows things that are concerning. And there's lots of information out there that shows things are better. Either way, when it comes to science, there really is no clear winner. We have to continue to test the results over and over and over again. And you're really the objective in science is to find out how many times you can get that result. How many times are you comfortable with those results after so many times of doing it? But the Washington Post, just like my wife Mari says, is driving segregation here. They want to lump the climate deniers into the Republican Party so they can turn, so they can just feel the Democrat supporters basically fire. They want to fuel it, they want to throw gasoline on it. Enrage people, oh, it's those climate-denying, vaccine-denying, COVID-denying, evil, wretched Republicans. That's what the Washington Post is doing. In instead of reporting the news, they're giving you an opinion about people that they don't really know. I wish they would take the time to look into Steve Malloy's background and his education. And just how smart this guy is and, and what great work they do at the Heartland Institute. I wish they would take the time to look at that. I wish they would stop lying to our face like they are right here. They're, they're, Washington Post is calling the control of gasoline engines and the ability to eat red meat and fly airplanes. They're calling that a conspiracy theory. Washington Post. Folks, impossible meat is owned by Al Gore. Al Gore has invested billions of dollars into Impossible Meat. Impossible Meat is now serving Whoppers, by the way. That's right. Your Whopper is probably an Impossible Meat. When they run out of regular Whopper meat, they're like, eh, they'll never know. And most likely, you probably don't know. I bet you've eaten uh, an Impossible Meat Whopper and not even known it, honestly, unfortunately. Okay, so what happens when President Joe Biden makes the Build Back Better a bill, a law, what happens? These climate change policies go into effect that encourage businesses to switch their meats, stop eating red meat, methane's driving up the temperatures. So we got to get rid of the red meat. We got to get plant-based meat. I'm here to tell you here something, folks. Grand Solar Minimum has a record history of destroying crops, disrupting crops. So if you're going to cut off meat consumption and you want people to eat plant-based meat, 
but you can't grow it, how are you going to fill that void? It's just like the whole solar and wind power, and you want to get rid of coal and natural gas. But how are you going to fill that void when you need more energy, when you need more power for the grid? They share similarities because the grand solar minimum affects both the power grid and affects crops. But they want you to eat plant-based meat, but yet we're having trouble right now with crops. In fact, produce, uh, I happen to know people who work in big box retailers, and they are telling me that they are now importing their produce from countries they don't usually get their produce from. This is a major grocery box store chain that is now importing produce from other countries they don't usually use, but they have to because of supply issues. Mari and I got a call from Adapt 2030, leaving us a message talking about the concern of the chemicals and fertilizers that are becoming, let's just say, short supply and how people are scrambling to try to find substitutes and alternate chemicals to grow their crops. Now, we also have a farmer friend in McCook, Nebraska, Matt Bros. And we talked earlier in the year before I talked to, or before Dave left us that message, and I can confirm what Dave is talking about is, is absolutely correct. Because Matt told me that the supplies to grow next year were more expensive and harder to get. And he said he might just have enough to get next season off, but he's concerned about future prices and future availability because he's never experienced, never experienced these supply issues and these prices. Farmers are worried right now, folks. Farmers are concerned. And you could hijack the grand solar minimum and call it climate change and crisis, whatever you want to call it, climate crisis, whatever you want to call it. But we can't ignore the fact that food prices are soaring. Chemicals and other supplies used to grow crops are soaring. Fuel prices are soaring. We've got a major problem and we haven't even gotten into the teeth of a grand solar minimum. So Washington Post. Why do you think they want to shut down Christian Westbrook and Steve Malloy? Because, unfortunately, what we're sharing right now carries more fear than what the mainstream media has with their lives. And what drives people? They, they say fear drives people, right? So they're more worried about how much more fear is being driven from our community. So that, that's going to hurt their control of the sheeple. But we're not doing this to control anybody. We're showing this information to put people on alert, to have them prepared for what's coming. Be ready for high food prices. Be ready for crop loss. Be ready for energy prices. They're already here. I just got my bill for the month of December. <laughs> this is not a huge house, folks. But I can tell you right now, I am paying four times, well, no, two and a half. Two and a half times more this winter to heat my home than I did last winter. It's insane. So people like us are out there alerting people. While our energy prices continue to soar, we start to see cold records breaking everywhere. We see power outages because of storms. And people are going to be sitting in the dark, whether because of a blackout or a severe storm event. And now we're going to have problems with people freezing, hypothermia, other issues. We saw in Texas where pipes were frozen, you know, literally just icicles forming from the ceilings because of all the pipes busting. They're not insulated for this kind of weather. They're not ready for this kind of weather. All right. Texas does not prepare for eight degrees and below and freezing pipes. That's it. I just looked at a comment in the chat. Mari says, we just want people to be ready. The past few years has been amazing watching things unfold. As much as I want to say I'm shocked, I'm not, sadly. And she's not. And every time we talk to someone like Dave from Adapt 2030, 
and other people in the community, and we talk and we share information and we talk about things, how they're going right now. We all, Mari and I look at each other and she's like, I'm not surprised. This doesn't surprise me. This does not shock me. We've been told this for years. Everything we've been told is unfolding right before our eyes. And she's right. Everything that we've been told and taught is happening the way it's been told. So again, folks, don't be fooled by mainstream media. The Washington Post is garbage. They're trying to fuel hate towards anyone who supported Republicans, towards anyone who supports freedom of choice when it comes to putting a shot in your body. They want to attack anybody out there who have an issue with COVID restrictions because maybe they're not warranted or maybe it doesn't match the science. They want to issue hate towards people who want to look at both sides of the science, not just warming, but cooling as well, and factor in natural cycles. Now the mainstream media is trying to build its followers to hate people who ask questions. That is what the media is doing, folks. Point blank. Boy, it feels good not to be monetized because YouTube would never let us say stuff like this on the air. But now that we're not getting ads, they don't care if what we say anymore as long as we're not being vulgar. But again, folks, it's the truth. It's the truth. The Washington Post is trying to fuel hate. You talk about them trying to always make the Republican Party look like they're a bunch of racist bigots. Well, look at what they're doing here. They're frothing their supporters up. They're frothing some of these liberals up who just can't stand Republicans anyway. Now everyone's going to be grouped in to this non-virus taken seriously, non-shot having, non-global warming believing people into one group. And then they'll blame them also for the January 6th Capitol attacks. Where does it stop, folks? I tell you. Yeah. Brian says, we're going to die. Of course we are. We all die, right? That's part of natural cycles. We live, we die. Let's check out some weather. All that talk about climate's got me thirsty for a forecast. What do you say? So we talked about earlier in the broadcast, snow in the northwest, snow in the northeast. That's going to start this weekend, and the mid-Atlantic is going to get the worst of this. Now, earlier in the week, I want to share this story, but Monday in my area in the northeast, we were told that 12.6 inches of snow was going to fall right here. Tuesday, it went to four to eight, and by Wednesday, it was three to six, and then Wednesday night, it was a coating. I want to give you guys a tip. Whenever you see on your AccuWeather forecast on a Monday for a storm that's going to happen on Friday, and it starts trending downwards after that consecutively, each forecast is continuing to go down, chances are it's not going to do anything. Vice versa. If the, if the totals are low and continue to go up each day, that means the confidence is building for a significant event. So just remember that next time you get your uh, alerts on your app and it's Monday and you're looking at Friday and it says, oh, I might get 12 inches of snow and it starts to show less and less each day, there's a good chance that it won't even snow at all. And vice versa, if it starts low, it's more likely it could go high if it continues to trend that way. So a little thing, I, it could be just a coincidence, but I don't think so. I, I've, I've noticed this. For several years, every time it starts going one way, usually that's the trend and it'll continue that way. But anyway, yeah, that 12 feet is turning into maybe an inch, if that. The heaviest of the snow is going to be along the northeastern part of the United States, New York City, Jersey, Philly, D.C. You guys are going to get some heavy snow. Parts of Massachusetts, Connecticut, Connecticut, Rhode Island as well, and parts of New Hampshire will get some light snow. This is Friday this is moving off to the coast. Maine will see some heavy snow in the southern part. And then high pressure builds in over the Ohio Valley. Some lake effect snow for Buffalo. Again, not as much as what you guys got the other day. 13 inches of snow reported at Buffalo Airport just here recently. Another low pressure system forming over in Canada. So you guys are getting plenty of snow, especially in eastern Canada. Rain for us here in the Ohio Valley. And then this storm here on Sunday, January 9th, could bring some ice to the northeast, but mainly rain to Pennsylvania southward to the east coast. But behind it, some really blustery cold weather, and that will generate snow showers across the western part of New York, central New York, on into Vermont and New Hampshire. Those appear to be lake-enhanced snow showers as well. High pressure settles in once again January 11th on Tuesday bringing colder and drier air across the, the Great Lakes, the mid-Ohio region, and the northeast. 
So high pressure in the Great Lakes in the Northeast and high pressure settling into the Northwest. More winter weather moving into the Northwest. The break is over for you guys. Some light snow across New York on Thursday, January 13th. Uh, BC and Alberta also getting a little bit of a break on the 14th. And then we start to see some action picking up once again here around the Great Lakes on the 15th of January. System along the Gulf Coast will combine with this low pressure up north, bringing moderate snowfall by Sunday, January 16th. I do believe this could be the first significant snowfall for the state of New York and moving into the Northeast that weekend as well into Monday. Things could get really hairy in southern and southeastern Maine as well. But this is a two-day snow event, so we could see up to 8 to 10 inches of snow. I know this is far away, and I'm really throwing these numbers around, but this system has been showing up in the models a couple different times. And I think this could be, like I said, the first significant snowfall for the folks out here in New York. This low-pressure system out in the Atlantic is trending south right now. And this is January 19th. So if this storm tomorrow starts to show me it's going to start tracking this way a little bit, Get ready because we could see a doozy of a storm that following couple days after the one on the 19th. Or I'm sorry, the one on the 14th, 15th through the 16th. Moving along, the storm moves off the coast. More high pressure building in further south this time, too. More cold weather returning to the Tennessee Valley. That's right, y'all are getting snow again. January 20th into January 21st. Snow in Ohio, Michigan, Wisconsin, Indiana, and Illinois. As it goes towards the northeast, this is a lighter batch of snow on Friday, January 21st, probably about an inch or about inch to three inches for most of us in New York, New Hampshire, and Vermont. A little heavier on the Massachusetts side, though. And by the time we get to January 22nd, uh, maybe a clipper system moving across New York. That's my birthday, by the way. Cold, 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 cold. Lake effect snow scheduled for Buffalo and the South Towns as well on January 22nd. More snow for you out west, though. Montana and the Dakotas are starting to see more of that white stuff at high pressure dominating the majority part of the United States. So what's that do to our temperatures? It's going to be really cold. Let's back up. Here we are today. You see that northern Arctic air trying to infiltrate the United States? It's making its way now, folks. It's setting things up. We're seeing that green trying to make that last final push here into the east, and then after the 10th of January, well, that's it. That's about enough of that green in the Northeast and the Ohio Valley and the Northern Plains states. Staying pretty cold across the Northwest as well. So we're going to see 40s and 50s across the South and then a big batch of Arctic air starting to descend towards the lower 48 by the time we get to mid-January. That's right, folks. Sub-zero temperatures are on the way for the northern parts of the United States, around the Dakotas, Wisconsin, and in the Northeast. Here we get a taste of some teens right there. Negative 15, negative 26 at the border on the 16th of January in Minnesota, and then look at the really cold air starting to move in by the 17th into the 18th. More of the Northern Plains, Ohio, uh, Great Lakes, really starting to see like the 19th, negative 26 in Southern parts of Minnesota, negative 26 in Wisconsin, single digits across the Great Lakes and the Northeast, and they could see sub-zero temperatures by late part of January 20th, 21st, and 22nd. Look at this dip here. By the 22nd of January, folks, negative 32. So the Northern Plains states really seeing a good chance for some of that serious cold air by the end of this month. And the way this is trending, we could see that cold air sweep across the Great Lakes into the Northeast and really send some shock waves through the Northeast. So we haven't seen nothing yet, folks. Winter has barely begun. And this is a good look at what we're looking at, how much cold we actually can expect. Folks, there's plenty of cold air coming in from the Arctic, and it does not look like we're going to run out of any energy whatsoever. There's lots of bright pink filling up most of Canada and trying to push its way south into the lower 48. Taking a look at our snow totals, well, again, the first couple days of January, not so much. Mo, you guys in the Northwest obviously seeing the higher amounts. Across the Plains states, not too much either. And then we get past January 11th, and we start to see a little bit of snow in New York. A few 7, 8-inch areas there. Mainly kind of quiet, mostly in Canada and the Northwest. Once again, more snow for Colorado on the 14th of January. And then things start to pile up a little bit more in the Northwest, or in the Northeast, I should say. Take a look at that. Greens all over the Northeast as we get towards the end of January. So, 
as we get deeper into the winter, and January is, you know, mid-January, late January is the heart of winter here in the Northeast for sure. We are definitely seeing that cold air settling, but now we are starting to see more of that snow taking over in the Northeast, the Great Lakes, and the Northwest. The Northern Plains, you guys are getting the bulk of the cold. And another reason, too, we, when you have the kind of cold that we're going to see, in this region up here, okay, you're going to have lower snow melts. The air is too cold sometimes, too dry, nothing falls, no snow. It feels like there's ice in the air, but it, that's not the case. So when you're seeing those negative 32 degree temperatures, you're not going to squeeze any kind of moisture out of a cloud. That's some serious high pressure, folks. So that's why we're seeing the less snowfall here in the northern plains. Obviously, we're not seeing that kind of cold in the Northeast. Actually, it's still kind of relatively above average out here. Uh, but it, recently, it's been acting more itself as far as cold weather. But still, nowhere near that kind of Arctic cold. So you see that really dramatic Arctic cold, we see less snow. We see about average or slightly above average, and that's why we're seeing the above uh, amount of snow. There's more moisture in the atmosphere. Therefore, uh, when it hits that cold area, it's turning it into snow. But... Again, some serious high pressure here, drying the air up, and that's why we're not seeing that much snow here across the northern plains, even really the Midwest. I mean, if you go into Ohio for this time of year, three inches of snow on the ground, you know, that's better than what they usually have, but it's not a whole lot, folks. And checking out La Nina, yep, it's still there, Point, uh, 1.057 below baseline, so no change in that. La Nina is expected to last all the way through March, maybe even early April. Continue to watch that. And, folks, if you like what you see, check out our, our, our network page, really, WTFSky.org. There you will find all of our websites for Grand Solar Minimum, I Love CO2, our news segment called Middleman News, and, of course, Mari is going to start things back up at WTF Sky, where anything goes, folks. Anything goes. We are going to show you some content like never before. If you guys want to support us because YouTube, Google have taken away any advertisements or monetization to our channels, you can go to this link here, check out for t-shirts or donate to us, or hell, just become a Patreon member for just a buck a month. We will be doing call-in shows. Our official launch, I think, is going to be around February 1st, and in the month of February, we'll be scheduling call-in shows on Saturday nights. So we're getting really close to being back to normal content. And for those of you who are already Patreon members and have been waiting for that call-in show, thank you for your patience. Thank you for your continued support, especially since we haven't really been on the air much lately, just trying to get things wrapped up with the move and the cleanup and all that other stuff. You know, it's like to move out one house into another, blah, blah, blah. But anyway, we really appreciate our supporters. You guys are the reason why we're still able to be on the air. You're the reason why this channel is not going to leave. Uh, nothing is going to keep this channel from broadcasting the truth or reporting on natural climate science. That's going to do it for me tonight. I want to say hello to a few people out there in the chat. Knife Collector, good to have you. Very enthusiastic gardener. Hello. And then, of course, hello to my lovely, beautiful wife, Mari. Glad to see you in the chat, as always. TJ Smith, good to have you, sir. Arnold Schmidt, hello. Edward, Brian, thank you for joining us. j Dog, nice to have you as well. And many, many others, new faces out there as well. Um, I'm glad you guys are aboard. And continue to follow us. We will be airing a interview that we did with Adapt2030 in the coming weeks. Hopefully, we'll have that out by the 1st of February. But Mari and I did a sit-down with um, David on his radio show and really had a great discussion about Grand Solar Minimum and the changes that we're seeing and some of the prices that are jumping up really high. I mean, I, I think it was a great talk, and I know you guys will enjoy it. So Mari and I will reshare that on our uh, channel as well as soon as possible. Rhea, good to see you as well. I didn't want to forget you out there. And Shirley Davis, of course. Of course, Shirley, good to see you. Wendy, also good to see you. All right, guys, that's going to do it for us tonight. Thank you once again for tuning in to the Grand Solar Minimum channel for the latest on Grand Solar Minimum news. Until next time, we will talk soon. Take care, everybody.
Do you like this show? Give us a thumbs up. Want to support us more? Share to your favorite social media platform. Buy a t-shirt or become a Patreon. All links are in the description below.